Hi, Rosemary. Hi, Bevan. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Bevan Clare, and I am here with Rosemary Gladstar today, who doesn't really need an introduction, but in case, in case this was someone's first time um, having to getting to know you, Rosemary is an herbalist and a world-renowned educator. In fact, she was one of my first herbal teachers, and she is an activist. She's the founder of Sage Mountain, uh, which is a, an herbal retreat center and a botanical sanctuary, the founding president of United Plant Savers, and a long-term advocate for plant conservation and sustainability. And she's the director of the New England Women's Herbal Conference and founder and past director of the International Herb Symposium, and always up to something new despite also kind of retiring at the same time. So, so thanks, Rosemary, for coming and, and talking to us. Oh, thanks, Devin. It's a joy. Yeah. So I would love to know, what is, you're an herbalist. It, it permeates everything you do, I'm sure. But what, what is your day-to-day -day life like as an herbalist right now? What do you, what do, you do? <laughs> well, it's certainly changed over the years. You know, I think um, it's kind of like how as herbalists, every season we're doing something different, right? Well, it's the same with the seasons of your life. So when, when I was a child, I was, you know, running, learning about plants, just running kind of wild on the farm. And when I got to be a young adult. I was doing a lot of backpacking and hiking. And then I, as an adult, it just seemed like I kind of turned all my energy totally into the plants and, you know, kind of did like everything really. <laughs> you know, but I, as I got older, I'm, I'm in my early 70s now, you know, I started to feel that longing to kind of get back to where I was as a child, just spent time running around with the plants. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that. So, so just recently, I'd say in the last couple of years, um, my, my daily life looks very differently than it has for all of my adult years. So um, I just am spending a lot more time with the plants, which I was really longing to do. And there's so many years there where, of course, I was with the plants all the time, but not in that deep heartful, quiet way. So I spend a lot of time in my garden. I've been doing a lot of self-healing um, these past few months. So the plants have just embraced me. Um, I've been working a lot in my family. Like I've always been an enormous advocate of home herbalism and, you know, every herbalism in the home as well as on the corner and in the community. So I, you know, really been practicing a lot, but it's with my mother and my family. Um, and so it's, you know, really my work has really been in a much more quiet way. And I would say, it reminds me again of when I could just get up and when I was a child and I could just get up and go out in the fields, you know, so I've been going out in the fields a lot, out in the garden, out in the, just kind of wandering with the plants and letting them maybe enter me again and teach me again. So, but I don't feel it's like for maybe for the first time in 40 or 50 years, I don't feel it's about bringing something out into the world in such mm -hmm. a way, but more of bringing something down into my own quiet world. So, mm. yeah. So what are some plants you've interacted with recently that have been powerful <laughs> for you? Well, I would say they've been, you know, like all my old friends, like I had this, it was like one of those very first experiences that happens to you when you're a child. And also that's probably something all of us who have been educators teach about, you know, and it's those boo-boo plants. And uh -huh. so I, I was out actually just a couple of days ago running out to the meadow. It's all covered in clover. And I was barefoot, of course, and I stepped right on a bee, which I felt terrible about. I landed on him really hard. He got me back. I got stung major. It was a major sting. And, you know, of course, right there, right, right where I stopped, stepped on that poor bee, there was a big plantain. And I had one of those, you know, remarkable experiences of just picking that plantain, chewing it up, putting it on my foot, and in just a few minutes, feeling the pain all go. And I have to say, I felt as delighted at that moment as the very first time when I was probably six when that happened, you know, mm. it was a marvelous experience to just, and it's not like I haven't been putting, you know, using plantain all these years, but you know, <laughs> it, was, it was like, there it was again, just when you needed yeah. it. It's that wonderful instantaneous relationship that those plants are always there for us. Mm. So once again, it was one of those beautiful aha moments. Yeah. It's almost hard to believe that there's anything that simple that can help, you know, right now, I think in the world, you know, just knowing that, right, plantain, plantain still just does this. You can just chew yeah. it up and put it on the boo-boo. We need like a really big plantain, like for, you know, the world. everyone yeah. chews on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that's what you're saying. Like the bigger teaching of that is, is that those plants are really there 
And of course, they can't heal all the woes of the world, but they can certainly remind us of what's beautiful and strong and potent and powerful, and also what we can do, you know? So not just even in the sense of taking a poultice and putting it on, but even just being with them, you know, like, and so many people I know during this whole COVID experience has have been able to get out, not everybody, of course, but there's lots of people who are spending far more time in nature than they have in a long time. And they're allowing yeah. nature to build them up, you know, and, you know, build our immune systems, build our inner strength, build our sense of wholeness that we need right now. So I think the plants are working their magic. We just have to be aware and open to it. Mm. Yeah. Right. Or have something call our attention to it, like a bee. <laughs> Like a bee. Okay. My good husband said to me, so that should be a lesson in wearing shoes. I said, no, absolutely not. It's not about it at all. I want to I want to know if I step on a bee, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just really a remember lesson to remember to look down and see what's next that you can use for healing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A caution to walking on flowers, right? It's yes, uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So it sounds like you, I, I really appreciate the idea of of starting in one place and moving through these stages and moving to one where you're, you know, you're revisiting some of those childhood pieces. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, brings up a question of if you were to, if you were able to go back and meet a younger you, I, I don't know, really know when that would be, but maybe those young adult years or something like that and share some wisdom that you've gained. What would you, what would you share with yourself? Oh, I think I would say, you know, you did well, Rosemary. <laughs> You followed your heart. You listened to the plants. You were brave and courageous. All those times I was so afraid to step up or stand up in front of people and teach, you know, because I'm actually quite a shy person when it comes right down to it. That was never, never easy for me, even after all the years. But I just would always say yes, and I would do it. And I felt like the plants just fed me and flowed through me. So I feel like I would just say, you know, you followed your heart. But I think also the one thing I probably would say is, you know, and like any boss, the plants, like any boss, when they find a good worker, they'll work you to death, right? You, you have to be able to set your boundaries. And I really never was very good at that, of just saying, oh, I can't do this, or no, I want to do this. So I would think I would just say, but you need to work into that time for other interests if you have them, and most especially time to spend with your friends and family. Mm -hmm. I think that's so critical, important, because, you know, yeah, I think that it's important to just remember that, you know, for herbalists, I think it's every, almost every herbalist I know, it's very hard because there's no separation between life and work. You know, it's yeah. not like we go to work or we do our herbalism and then we go home. I mean, for most herbalists mm -hmm. I know, you know, I'm speaking generally here, it's like that is our life. Yeah. So, but within that life, it's very important to look at balance, I think. And mm -hmm. so I think I followed my dreams. I listened to the plants. I spoke my truth. I was very courageous. I did all that really well, but I certainly did not find a lot of places to weave in balance. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and the only place I probably really feel that I would have liked to change is with friends and family, for sure. Mm. You know, I think mm. I think they it's better for those to come first and not mm. second, even to the beauty of the plants mm. and the, to the passion in our hearts. I wonder what it is about herbalism that's like that. As you were speaking, I was thinking how, you know, if we look at careers that have been around for a long time, or, I mean, it's, all, it's weird to even call it a career, just life paths that have been around for a long time, things that were traditional, um, I feel like people would step away from them. I mean, if you're a blacksmith or something, you'd be a blacksmith and then you go home or, you know, you'd leave your shop or if you're a teacher, you know, you teach and then you kind of leave. But it seems like with herbalists, it's, it's just so entangled that it, it, it's like, I don't know how I would go home from being an herbalist or away or, you know, any of that. I think our ancest ancestors would really recognize our, our challenge with that. I know, I think it's just part of a genetic makeup. I think that, you know, because um, like more than most things that we were just speaking about or career choices or life paths even, we have evolved in relationship to the plants, not the other way around. So they're, we're entwined with them in much greater ways than we even have the ability to understand unless you think the closest you get to that is when you're on plant medicine and journey, right? When you actually, your boundaries of who you are split open. So that it's, um, so even on 
levels that are difficult to understand, we're interwoven and they're interwoven to us. So you don't leave that behind. And I also think that's why herbalism, herbalists, when they hear that calling, whether they're young or older, when the calling comes, why we so strongly respond to it. You know, like why almost everybody, when, when they realize that there is an herbalist in their heart, you know, waiting to come out, it's almost like they found their life path, you know? And I think, again, it's not that you found a path, you found a part of yourself, you know, like a, like a tissue in yourself. Of course, I'm not explaining that very well, but, um, and so, because I, this isn't just yours or my experience, it's the experience of almost everybody who is called to serve the plants. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, no, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I, I remember once being in like a marketing meeting around herb programs and them saying, so, you know, why do people choose this? And I was just like, it's a calling. I mean, they just, it, yeah, it's like a little fire that's mm -hmm. inside them that, that as soon as they get that, that breath on it, that it just, it just catches fire. And it's not, mm -hmm. it's never, it's not like you went to your high school guidance counselor or, you know, or somebody just said like, I think maybe you should look into herbalism. Um, you know, where it's <laughs> but what's so funny these days is it actually, you know, which makes me laugh. It actually is a career choice for people, but you know, it's when, true. Yeah. I mean, even when, even when we would say when you first launched off and certainly when I did, it wasn't a career at all. In fact, my parents were very worried about me. You know, they wanted me to grow up and, find something to do for work. It was like, oh, you know, they were yeah. very pleased to see that the work actually grew up around me and supported me, you know, so that was kind of cool. That, that's one way to look at it. That your analogy made me think of a farmer saying like, isn't it nice that this beautiful farm and all these crops just grew up around me and supported me when I think there's quite a lot of work that uh, you put into creating this I you know it's obviously it's not you that created herbalism but you created so many people who went on to be teachers and their students and just all of that awareness so it's pretty pretty exciting I was blessed with timing you know yeah and even yes. the name I mean I have to think about it there was something magical happening you know that I would get that name I always think like if my I have two sisters and two brothers but if my sisters had gotten that name I would have had to fight them for it right right yeah <laughs> I mean, I love my sister's name, Diane and Betty, but I would have had to fight Betty and Diane to get my name, right? But my parents knew to name me that from the time I was born. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, I don't think I knew that that was your birth name. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's interesting. I was interesting. named after my two grandmothers, Rose and Mary. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it was, yeah, these, and then, so Rose, more plants. That's, that's really, oh, I love that. I love that. So, so I want to ask you a question about the idea of having a magic plant power. And the magic plant power is that you can bring any plants anywhere in the world. So you have, the, you have a bag of seeds, but it's only one plant you can plant. But you, wherever you plant it, it will grow robustly and beautifully. And, just, and you can propagate this plant anywhere in the world successfully. What, what plant do you think you would like to bring everywhere to, to everyone? <laughs> Just one plant? Yeah, you just you could only choose one plant, but but it will grow in any ecosystem. You could grow some tropical thing in northern Alaska. So it just but just one plant that you could just plant everywhere. Um well I guess the plant I, I keep getting two plants. Can I say two? Okay, yeah, you can have two. I, I knew you wouldn't follow the rules. Yeah, go but ahead. <laughs> the first one is the Babcock peach. I plant that anywhere because it's my very favorite fruit in the world and it doesn't grow here. I love Babcock peaches. Okay, they well why why do you love Babcock peaches before you move on? I, I don't know what Babcock peaches are, so you have to tell uh, me. I think they only grow in Sonoma <laughs> County where I grew up. They're a white fleshed peach that's the most oh. delicious, juicy peach in the world. And of course you can use peach leaves for medicine. Right. Just that deliciousness. I think if everybody could eat Babcocks every day, I think we'd be a happier race. Nice. Uh, so to be serious, so immediately that came to mind just because I can't grow peaches where I live and they're one of my favorite fruits, especially that white fleshed Babcock peach. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, and if anybody's listening who's ever had a chance to eat that, they would agree with me uh, completely. So then I think really I, the two herb choices I would choose, one is I would choose the hawthorn tree. Mm -hmm. It would give shelter. Um, it does grow in almost in many, many ecosystems around the world. So it's a common plant and it grows in many different forms. The Crotagus is a very large species. species. It's very adaptive. 
Um, but it can provide shade, it provides incredible fruit, not delicious fruit necessarily, but it makes great jams and jellies and juices. It's also an herb that's really incredibly um, healing, full of antioxidants, and it's you know good for us, and it's very good for the heart. It's also very good for sadness and grief and uncertainty in life. It's one of my favorite herbs for that. Um, and it's really beautiful in a very, even the, the, the little hedgerows one, in a very kind of craggly way, it's it's a very beautiful tree. And of course it does grow very large and there's a beautiful species of it too that are very ornamental, but you have something that's so adaptive, so nourishing, so beautiful in the environment with beautiful, beautiful little white blossoms. I think there's just absolutely nothing to love about it, you know? And then the other, of course, I would plant everywhere and it also grows just about everywhere. And not everybody would be happy to have this plant dropped off everywhere, but it's nettle, of course. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say nettle. I thought it would be number one, but then once we went to three, I was like, nettles is, are going to come up in here somewhere. Well, the only reason I didn't put it, I would put it under the Babcock for sure, but the only reason I didn't put it above Hawthorn, I think, is because so many people, you know, like farmers and people who have yards and stuff don't necessarily want nettle spread everywhere because it does have a, a fairly nasty sting. It can put up big welts, which is part of its medicine, all of us who work with plants know. But, you know, it's just such a, you could survive on nettle, you know, making delicious food. You can make gourmet food as well as survival food. And then it's just an excellent medicine for the whole body. You know, it's one of those, I think we need it right now. It's also tenacious. It will just, once it gets started, it will just spread like crazy. And again, I think we need that tenacity. We're, yeah. you know, we, our, our systems right now are not tenacious. We're like, I always say we're a little bit like iceberg lettuces, you know, we're just... <laughs> Right. We don't have enough roots that dig down when the going gets tough, you know, and we're seeing that a lot in young people and also in older people. So nettle is, um, and it has that nice protective sting, which I think is good, you know, it's kind and loving and gracious and, but then, you know, you treat it wrong and it's going to go and you're going to get a melt, <laughs> you know, and then if you know it's magic, you know, you can take the juice of that melt well to make yourself well. There's a lot of teachings in nettle. For yeah. That. So you know, and it's incredible to see nettle. It's like become so popular. I mean, like, wow, when I was growing up, nettle was a, just a, a, you know, almost a hated weed. And yeah, um, but, you know, it's, I think a lot of times we see these popularity of plants for two reasons. One is that you have people that have fallen in love with them for personal reasons. And they're, if they're teachers, they go out and advocate for them. You know, it's like mm -hmm. preaching about the nettle. But it's also the plants rise to the occasion when they're needed. And right now right. we need nettle. So nettle presents itself. It's caught, it, you know, people recognize it and then it spreads like wildfire. So. Yeah. Yeah. I learned, I learned a lot about nettles because when we, when I, we bought our house 10 years ago, I, you know, we bought our house 10 years ago, we had all this land and we had an animal paddock. So it's a big piece of land that has a oh, single yeah. gate in, and there's a big fence. And when I moved there, we moved the gardens, we moved everything. And, and I was, it was just a lot, you know, I had a one-year-old and, and so a lot of things, I just did the best I could thinking, okay, I'm going to put some things in the ground and put some things different places and then I'll move them later. Cause I don't know where I want to put gardens. I'm not really sure, but I couldn't deal with the nettles. So I actually remembered at one point, it was just, you know, <laughs> the one-year-old's going to end up in this big container yeah. of nettles I have. Could you just, so I just like stuck it in the paddock. And what it did was it just grew, it just grew directly into the, 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 the maybe six or eight foot opening of the paddock. Yeah. And so at this point now, it's, it's a solid like 20 foot deep wall of nettles. We just can't even get in there. One year I bought rubber mats and just tried to put them down so we could actually get into this part of our land. And no, they were, I mean, I, we put them down and the next year, I don't even know where they went. It was like they were digested, <laughs> like they're completely gone. So um, yeah, it's, but it's such a, it's such a protective. So I've decided that that paddock is just to be left alone. Like we're going to let it go back to nature. Nettles are going to protect it and we can, we can use the outside of the nettles and <laughs> just hope for the best. But yeah. what a, what an awesome plant. I think it's really interesting that when you chose plants, not surprising, but interesting. You didn't choose like rare plants or, you know, plants that we don't necessarily have enough of that, um, you know, I know that you've been involved in plant conservation your, your whole life and we've both been involved in different places. And I think some people would think, oh, you know, if I was going to plant a plant everywhere, I should plant these really rare plants because they must be more special or they must be better, you know, to plant golden seal or ginseng or, um, you know, 
unicorn, a false unicorn or something like that. So what, how, how would you think about the, the use or the desirability of having these more mundane plants like hawthorn and nettles versus like these really rare plants that you could cover the earth with? I think it's so interesting that you thought that you even thought that I, when you asked that question, I didn't even think about the rare plants. Well, one of the things is, is when you think about what you want to plant everywhere, you want to plant things that are everyday plants that people would use often, right? Mm -hmm. And what I've learned, this is, a, this is general, of course, you know, all of these statements are general. They're not like an absolute rule or a guideline about this. But what I've noticed in my life is that all of the everyday plants are generally the weedy plants and they're, what, they're the yeah. ones that adapt readily. They travel with people, they love traveling and they've been passed around by people. Herbalists have always loved sharing information. We very seldom guarded it. At least this has been my experience in my world travels that herbalists share information readily. They share seeds readily. And if they're not sharing, the plants themselves are sharing. They're jumping on you and going with you and traveling. <laughs> And, and, the, and it's these everyday plants that we use as food and for the daily medicines that are what really most of us deal with. And those rarer plants, those more exotic plants, and those plants that are often the ones that are either over harvested or disappearing because of habitat destruction that require very specific places to grow are generally those herbs that were used rarely. They would be more used when you had maybe perhaps a very serious illness and the everyday plants weren't working or you weren't using the everyday plants enough for them to work on your body. And so, you know, when I think about seeding the world, I would think about seeding it in exchanging information with others on these very useful daily plants. And that, mm. um, yeah, and how we help those other plants spread around the world, which they'll never spread around the world, by the way, mm. because they have, they're very specific about where they put their roots, where they put their toes down. Those plants, how we protect them is that we, you know, we speak out for them, we protect them by not using them, we protect them by harvesting them. There's tremendously good guidelines, which as you, as you know, and I think anybody who, who's been working with plants should know that there's a wonderful organization that Bevan, both Bevan and I have been involved in is United Plant Savers. And they give some really great guidelines about how we, how we can help these plants survive in their native environments. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say to that, that they also, can, can stretch out of those native environments. You know, the survival drive in humans is, and plants, especially I've seen, you know, those plants want to live. And so mm -hmm. a lot of these plants will adapt to environments that we think are different. So I think it's always worth experimenting, but we do generally find that they are more habitat specific. You know, mm -hmm. we definitely find that these plants are more specific for, for serious, not everyday kind of, or, you know, everyday, not the common kind of health problems that we encounter. So, yeah. I'd love for you to talk more about navigating some of the work that you've done in plants conservation, not necessarily specific to plant conservation, but, you know, you, you excel at standing up for what you believe in, but not doing it in a way that, that alienates people. And I think, you know, we, looking at plant con conservation as an example, um, you know, instead of offending and angering all of the herb companies around your, your, your plant conservation work and starting United Plant Savers and them feeling threatened that you were trying to take away their business and so on, instead, it, it, you know, you inspired them to um, rise right. up and do this. And so how did you do that? I mean, these lessons are so relevant. To, you know, today, I think plant conservation and herbal medicine is much more on people's radar because of a number of factors, especially United Plant Savers. But, um, but you know, there's parallels in all the things that need change right now. So how, how did you make change without creating so much hurt um, in your life? Well, thank you, Gavin. I think it has to do with respectful listening. You know, I think that really is the key. And, um, and also respectful li listening, especially to people who have different viewpoints than you do. Mm. You know, that, like, it's really important. And so uh, um, I'm not really the one who came up with the answer about how, you know, came up with that design to bring in the herb companies. In fact, I was probably more radical. I probably would have just said, no, we have to stop harvesting. But I had always had the ability to listen to other people who have differences. And, you know, and I think it started with my family. I have this very loving, kind family. And in, within that family, we have very different mindsets, but we all love each other. Mm -hmm. And we function well by just respectfully listening to each other. 
nobody ever necessarily trying to change one another's minds or directions, but being able to listen to where the other person was coming from and to use that as a way of moving ahead ourselves. So I had the ability when we first, I had, I think this was a magic ability. When I started United Plant Savers, I invited people who represented all the different aspects of herbalism. So even though I'm more of a folk herbalist, community herbalist, and an educator, I invited the wild crafter, the medicine maker, the manufacturer. So it is many different aspects. And then we respectfully listen to one another. And it was people like Michael McGuffin, who was president of APA, American Herbal Products Association, who said, if you want to ally with us, that's not the message to bring us. And mm. so it was listening and realizing that we needed these allies that, that we could see and how you bring the wild crafters in and how you bring the, the, the medicine makers and then the, the strong activists, you know, who are oftentimes, I hate to say this, but oftentimes the least effective are really listening respectfully, you know, how you bring all of those, not always, but you know what I'm saying? Sometimes mm. in the, when you're an activist, sometimes you're so opinionated, so strong and where you're coming from, you almost have to be to get your message across. Well, I, sometimes I take that stand, but inside myself, I always know it's a stand to get people to agree with me. I know that really at heart, I'm reading, trying to speak a message that really there's many voices that have to add to it. Am I making sense? Yeah, absolutely. But oftentimes people forget that, right? They yeah. forget that. So that was really how we did it. I would say the key was respectfully listening, really, really respectfully listening. Um, and, then, and then without that, not giving up your, what your morals are, what your belief is, but how to move forward with the, with the different feedback that comes in. So, so, it, so there was a lot of suggestions that came in from the herbal industry that didn't really meet with what our standards were. Mm -hmm. There were some that absolutely did. So it was how to move forward. It was not being swayed mm -hmm. necessarily to go to be less um, in, with less integrity than you wanted to carry forth, but how to how to, to to winnow through that and take the best of what was being offered to move forward. And that's how I have to say that I think that organization has just been the most remarkable organization. It, it always has represented a lot of voices and views. It's had to weather some pretty rough storms, but it comes through because I think of that ability to respectfully listen and to be open to the different ideas that came in. Mm. But still yeah. stay true to the integrity of its heart. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Right, so the, and, and that seems like what, that the, it's exactly what you've done. You know, you're listening, you're staying true to the integrity of your heart. Same with United Plant Savers. I think that's something that the organization seems to have kind of continued to carry out. Um, oh, absolutely. Even beyond so. your time there, and I love that. Yeah. So you, young herbalists are navigating all of this right now. And I think <laughs> the, the questions and the struggles and, you know, no one's going to ask the best way to make the right smelling potpourri or, you know, we're, it's like, the, we're not struggling with our beverage tea <laughs> options or the mold in our oils anymore so much. Um, you know, herbalism, I think, encompasses a bigger and bigger circle of, of our, of our lives and the, I mean, the idea of justice is integral to, to what many people view as herbalism now. Um, so if you were to kind of gently whisper something into the ear of all these young budding herbalists, what would you, what would you say? What, 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 is, what, is, what, is, what should we all listen to? They wouldn't know who it's coming from either. <laughs> I was going to say, I actually think that I really need to be the one listening these days, you know, like I'm sort of more in that listening place. I don't really feel I have a lot of answers for people, but the things that have guided me, and it's not like it comes easy, by the way, it's a practice mm -hmm. always, is, is to be respectfully listening, you know, to try to really listen to people and not just assume always that we know the way or have the answers. So I would, I would say, and be kind. I feel people they they don't really understand the power of kindness you know like mm -hmm. you can say the very same thing to people and say it with love and kindness as mm -hmm. you can rashly and harshly and it's going to be heard so much better because mm -hmm. all of us all of us even the most brash harsh person is basically a very sensitive human being mm -hmm. and um what i found is you know harsh like when somebody says something even when it's right to me and like they throw daggers in my heart the very first thing that happens is defense i you know, I feel my heart just kind of defending. And I know the same thing happens when I do that, where if those same words are coming at me, but in a kinder way, I'm able to really listen. So I think that's so 
I think kindness is a very powerful, it's not a wimpy tool, it's a very powerful tool. I think, um, I, I think people have forgotten, at least I believe this anyway, that when it all boils down, down to essence, that love is still the most important medicine that we have. And that we have to keep remembering that, you know, we have to be strong, we have to be courageous, we have to be always trying the best we can to walk our talk and stay in our integrity. And all of that is so easy to say and really a challenge to do, right? But I think more than anything, if we can do everything we do, always reminding ourselves to, to do it from a place of love in our hearts, we not only heal ourselves, but we heal everything else in the planet. And, you know, it sounds, it just sounds too simple, doesn't it? It sounds so simple, especially in these very rough, very hard times we're living in now. But really, when you think, when you think of it, every single master of this world, every single wise person of this world, every single great teacher of this world always comes back to that. That if you can do things from the greatness of your heart with love, um, it really is the very best way to heal this planet. And I think so many people have forgotten that. They, they just have forgotten because they, they forget how powerful the tools of love and kindness are. Yeah, there's, there, kindness is never wasted. And I, I think that call to love, we need so much more of it. It would, it would be an incredibly powerful thing. Thank you for well, Yeah, I think it's herbalist too, you know, because whenever we start to forget that, you go walking in a field of wildflowers and what rises up is, is just awe and gratefulness and thankfulness and this feeling of just peace and then love, you know, and that happens almost always when we are hurt and angry or I know I've been spending a lot of time with the flowers you know and with the plants these last few months and they really just bring me back to that place of love yeah 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 they do I I I thought so much about this in the kind of early hardest pandemic days when it was still winter but where I live the signs of spring started coming and I know for all for in the northern hemisphere um yeah, and that's for me. I that's just I get such a sense of love from watching the earth kind of be reborn <laughs> and coming up, and yeah. and the newness and uh, the newness and the oldness at the same time. It's it's the same thing every year, and yet it's so new and exciting, and um, and just that sense of things moving on and that yeah kinship. I think that's another thing that's very important for us to remind one another is that you know, we really are here in service and we're in service to one another for certain to our species and to all the animals, but really we're here in service to the earth. And we forget that. We're forgetting that, you know, with, in our own trials and tribulations, how much the earth needs us to stand strong and to really um, stand strong for her, that she has her own agenda going on. And whether we call the earth, all the names that we might call her, you know, even great spirit or God or whatever, that incredible life force that's on this planet that we live in, that we live on is that, you know, I, I kind of feel, I mean, I really do feel that she's wobbling on her path and that, you know, like in her path of, of, across the planets with her own relationship with the planets around her and that our job is to stand, to stay strong on her and to help her navigate. And that helps us. When you feel the earth under you shaking and quivering a little, which I think we're all feeling a bit, right? Mm -hmm. That sense of solidness doesn't feel so solid. Rather than ourselves becoming like, you know, like little damaged nerve endings. We need to come strong into ourselves through our food, our thought patterns, our friends, our family, all those things that really root us deeply. Because as each of us as cells are rooted deeply, we start to heal the whole. Mm. And it, when you think of it in those terms, it's like magical, you know, like even if you never lived to see that happen, the fact that you've contributed in a small way is grand. That can mm -hmm. fill you up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that can. But, I mean, the, the, there's always this, the abundance of love out there. Nature's full of it. The kindness of nature, the generosity. So that even if we're not finding those things in our human circles as easily, the plant circles are yeah. there for those. So who's inspiring you right now, Rosemary? Oh, yeah. I think it's a question I love to ask the people I interview because I'm sure that whoever's inspiring you would inspire all of us. And if, whether it's, you know, music or writing or you know, oh. any anything who's inspiring to you oh great well right now the sky is because there's big thunder clouds going over and I can hear the <laughs> crashing. 
So I would say probably in my life right now, the person who inspires me, the person who inspires me the very most is my mom. Mm. You know, she's living with me now and I'm caring for her and she's caring for me. We're helping each other with our broken hearts. And she's 96 and really she's had a, my mother was Armenian. She was born right after the Armenian genocide, like just months afterwards. So she's had a very, you know, we can't say that her life has been easy for her. They lost everything. They lost all of every member of their family, except just a small few that survived. And uh, they came here as immigrants. They lost their country, you know. But my mother is actually one of the most joyful people I know. She's just a radiant person. And she, it's a choice she makes. It's not like, I think it's in her. I think it was somehow seated in her, maybe out of such tragedy choice. I watch her. Even now I can see, I can enter her mind and see her maybe when she's hurting a little bit, getting up because she just, I say, how are you feeling? She goes, great. I feel good. Mama, how are your eyes today? Because she's got a little macular degeneration going. Mm -hmm. I can see perfectly. (laughs) (laughs) And she's done that her whole life, right? And, you know, we would say, you know, some people used to say, well, she just lives in her own world. And I always say, yeah, it's a really amazing world. She's made it work incredibly for her both in her family and her relations. It's obviously all her children love her. So yeah, she's amazing. Um, and so, and also just being around somebody who's lived that old, who's lived that long, um, that's also inspiring, you know? So and then I'm also totally inspired by my friend, Rocio Alicorn. She's just mm. one of the most amazing healers and it's been, a, and a teacher. And it, it's been fun for me to watch her grow up into that role. Cause I met her first 30 years ago, actually, when I first moved to New England. I, before I moved, even moved here, actually, I was still living in California, so it was a little over 30 years ago, when she was just stepping in to her role as a leader and a healer. And so to watch her just devote her life to that and to open up to all the teachings that come into her and then to watch the graciousness of her being as she allows that to flow out to everybody in her teachings and in her healing, um, it's really been a beautiful experience. And I'm also always inspired. I haven't seen my, my friend, uh, Tirona Lodog, in a long time. But I have to say, as a teacher and as a human being, she is such an inspiration for me because she's just so, so wise and bright and brilliant. I actually think that she's maybe a goddess that's come down into the planet. I was just to say to her, she's just draped herself in human clothing. But you can yeah. sort of still see that she's a goddess. You know, like she's not quite human. <laughs> um, and but then... Really, I think aside from that brilliance is just the and her, you know, her education and everything. It's, it's her kindness. She's just one of the kindest pe- people, and again, always reaching out to other people and sharing. Um, yeah, I mean, those are the. I mean, there's so many. I've been inspired so by so many, so many people. There's our friend Paul Strauss out in, you know, out in Ohio, and you know, all the plant people I know. But yeah, those are the people who pop into my mind just right now at this moment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, they, that those are great. Those are great examples. And well, most of us probably can't plug into your mom um, as as easily and and get some of the same teachings from her. You know, Paul Strauss and Rocio are out there, and and yeah. listeners can find out about them. And um, Tirana Lodog is, is Dr. Lodog is definitely out there. She'll be the keynote at the HG oh, this year, so, that. so that's really fun. And um, those are all people that that can be can be looked up. So thank you for reminding us of, of all of them. Um, I have one last question for you. Moving on, and and that is, you know, you mentioned when I asked you about plants you've interacted with, you brought in a plant that you have had this long relationship with. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anything anything new that's happened with you with a plant. Something it could be a new plant that you didn't really have a lot of experience with lately, or it could be a new use of a plant or some completely different way of understanding or interacting with a plant that you love. What's been new and different? What's a new gift that's happened? Oh, well, let's see. That's maybe a hard one right now, you know, maybe because my mind's a little sluggish. I have to say, so this doesn't exactly answer your question, Sure, um, but it's a, it's a roundabout way, I think, is I, you know, I've always loved the flower essences. And I, you know, and in, in, as a teacher, you know, when you're teaching so many different aspects of herbalism, you find that people gravitate to different things, right? So a lot of, a lot of people just absolutely love the flower essences and other people who give them a good try find they don't work for them. And, you know, that's, I always say, oh, that's normal. Nothing's going to work for everybody. Nothing. 
So, um, except love, right? Anyway, but, um, but I've always believed in them and I've used them occasionally. They're, they weren't really, so I've always used rescue remedy. I always have them in my first aid kit. I always take them when I'm traveling. And I love those little rescue pastels they make, mostly because they taste so good. But, um, but during these last few months, um, I've used them extensively and I have to, I'm so grateful to everybody, all my friends who sent me flower essences that they made. I had, an, I had flower essence, they probably lined the house, right? They were on every table and every counter, <laughs> on my bedside, they're on the altars. But I, I could just go around and take them and I didn't really care what was in them. And after a while, oftentimes I forgot who even made that particular one. But they really helped, I'm laughing, you know, and smiling. Mm. And they really helped bring me back to myself. We call them often the gentle giants of herbalism, you know, they're so subtle. You, you know, can you say that you ever really know they're working only because you can laugh more, smile more, you know? But I have to say my, my relationship with the flower essences has really been delightful for me to rediscover mm. these last few months. and. You know, I definitely was, was drinking teas and I had some tinctures, but I, the, the thing that, I, that was for heart and grief, again, many that were sent to me by friends, but the flower essences were, mm. yeah, they're, you know, they just work so subtly on your emotions and, and people sometimes put sweet little things in them like maple syrup and glycerin. So they even taste really good. You know, like the, mm. so, so that was one thing too, that, Oh yeah, that is something that I learned that for grief and when your heart is really heavy, it's good that things taste really, really good. Mm. You know, because, so as an herbalist, I love bitter and I love the bitters and you know that well. Mm. I have no problem with foul tasting herbs. You know, I can just eat them and I love that I can. But I definitely, through sadness, I found that I was always gravitating towards what was sweet. Mm -hmm. Sweet mm. helped me a lot. So even those flower essences that had a little bit of maple syrup in them or glycerin or rose essential oil or something like that. I was gravitating towards those. I, I found that sweetness is really essential. Sweetness of spirit, sweetness of heart, and sweetness of things that you ingest is really important when you're grieving or depressed or sad. That's what you need more sweetness in your life, right? <laughs> I love that you said sweetness because when you were describing to me about how you had these different flower essences, they were all different and from different people kind of scattered around your home, it reminded me of, of um, like a bee pollinating, like going along and, and you know, the, the bee isn't really thinking like, oh, I'm going to go pollinate things. And so they can reproduce. It's just like, oh, there's nectar here. Ooh, nectar here. Ooh, you know, and so it immediately remind, of course it was sweet, you know, you were kind of flitting from one place to another and, and experiencing these medicines and. So yeah, I, I love that 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 new that new way of thinking about it. You've got one right there. I see. And this is a red. This is a redwood flower essence with a little bit of glycerin, oh, which is especially yeah. valuable right now because of the forest fires yeah. in California. But this was one of my favorite because you know the sequoia are so strong and so powerful, and they live so long, and they're so sheltering. So it was it was one of my favorite right next to my desk. Oh yeah, I tell you, they're everywhere. I have little bottles. Of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that is good. That is true. That's a new relationship. I, you know, really have deepened my appreciation for the essences. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Thank you for, for leaving us with that. And so, yeah, and thank you for everything you've shared. It's, it's so powerful to have these calls towards, towards some of our roots and our simplicity and towards love and kindness and, and just mm -hmm. the path of an herbalist in a good way. So thank you for that today, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for listening. And yeah, blessings.